Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this very interesting e-conference. Of course, you do realize we are doing something totally different. If it was back before the COVID days, we would be in a conference hall. This time, we're coming to you live on your TV screens, talking about the oil and gas sector. And this e-conference is sponsored by um, Sinok, Uganda National Oil Company, brought in conjunction with JP Wong and the Stanbic Business Incubator. Before we begin, like any oil and gas situation or any oil and gas event, I must take you through a safety moment. In today's safety moment, I will emphasize that it is important for us to understand that COVID is wrecking havoc around the globe. It is also important for us to realize that it is key for us to stay safe. So our safety moment is all about you staying safe, washing your hands, sanitizing, and having your mask on like we are all doing in the studio. So ladies and gentlemen, that was our safety moment and good afternoon. Today's e-conference is a very interesting one. We have interesting guests, I would call panelists, but also these panelists are going to try and explain more about interventions in the sector, but more important of all, their experiences in the sector. Our first guest today online and coming to us from Nairobi, she must have been stuck, of course, having been caught up in Nairobi, is Benita Bagheri. Benita Bagheri is a very interesting panelist who is a woman of achievement in the oil and gas sector, having won the 2018 Judges Award in Kenya and having been nominated as well for the Upstream Woman of the Year Award in 2018 for the Upstream Oil and Gas Awards and, of course, going on to win the award in 2019. So, Benita, welcome to this e-conference. Okay, and then of course our next interesting guest is Dr. Emma Naluima. For many of you who are into farming, you will realize or know this name, and a name that is synonymous with smallholder farming, but very interesting commercial farming. Dr. Emma Naluima is a private farmer, a private veterinarian, focusing on clinical medicine and health or heart health. She has previously worked for the National uh, Animal Genetic Resources Data Center, and was also an officer in Entebbe in charge of livestock environment. She has also worked for the President of the Republic of Uganda on his personal dairy farm to improve the genetics of his herd. And of course, she has served as a chairperson of the Red Cross Mbarara, holds the Bachelors of Science in Veterinary Medicine, Masters of Science in Health Services, and of course, holds a number of positions in several establishments. Our other panelists, a very crucial person to this discussion, comes from the regulatory space. This is Mr. James Musherure, who is the senior national content officer in charge of contracts and uh, in charge of contracts at the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. He holds an MBA in oil and gas from Aberdeen University, has previously worked at the Pet uh, Directorate of uh, Petroleum in the Ministry of Energy. He is passionate about the development of oil and gas in Uganda a sector that he has really gotten a massive uh, knowledge, about, uh, knowledge of over the, past, uh, over the past years. And then, of course, finally, is to introduce our host, Mr. Matthew Chaligonza, who is the senior, uh, so, sorry, who is the national content manager, rather, at the Chinese National uh, Offshore uh, Company in Uganda. Matthew, you're very welcome to the e-conference. Thank you, Tanya. So this is one hour that we have to really squeeze the most juice out of. But before we do that, I think it's very important for us to understand what the space is like in the oil and gas sector. And I think to take us through this, I will allow James Musherure to explain about the sector, talk about the Petroleum Authority, speak about the mandate of the authority to make us understand and have a general overview, and then we can go into the major discussions. James, take it on from here. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, our dear viewers, uh, welcome you to this show. I would like to thank Sinok Uganda Limited for organizing this first of its kind e-conference. You can you see that um, COVID has changed the way we do things. It's no longer the new, uh, the old way, but we have a new norm. Um, in the past, these supplier development workshops, which are the requirement of the law, have been in hotels, um, accessible not by everyone, but some people who participate in the sector mainly, and we've been doing it for over years. Mm -hmm. I think you remember, Tony, when you're still in total, we were doing these things over years. But for, because of the new COVID, we have moved to this kind of platform, which is good. So I'm here to represent the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. The Petroleum Authority of Uganda is a kind of a new institution that came on board in 2016. 
if you remember, after the discovery of oil and gas in about 2006, government started putting in place the necessary institutional and legal framework. Mm -hmm. And uh, among us, this was the National Oil and Gas Policy of 2008 that recommended that there should be institutions that take forward the sector, that there should be new laws that also take forward the sector. And in 2013, uh, government enacted two laws which are very important for us, the Petroleum Exploration, Development and Production Act, uh, or we know it as the upstream law, which covers only the exploration mm. and uh, development and then production. Then the Petroleum Refining, uh, Transmission and Gas Conversion Midstream Storage Act, or the Midstream Act, that handles the midstream elements, such as pipeline and refinery. Now, those laws put in place the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, and its mandate is to regulate the sector according to the laws and best international practice. We do that through, uh, we make sure we make look out for that the optimization of the reserves, we make sure that resource optimization is key, the right amount of oil is um, extracted in the proper way according to the best practices. We look out for costs because we operate under the production sharing agreement, mm. we make sure that the costs are not too high. We look out for environment, national content, the project is it economical, all these are under petroleum authority. Okay. But we don't regulate the downstream, which is uh, the petroleum, which are the normal petrol stations you see, to uh, Shell. Some of them are personalized, you find Ottawa's petrol station. Mm -hmm. We don't regulate that. So we regulate the pits upstream and the midstream, and we're new, and we're doing the best to make sure that we deliver the oil and gas sector in Uganda. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. That was a great introduction about the Petroleum Authority in Uganda, or um, uh, I, I mean, looking at their mandate and what they do. It's quite interesting because, as we all see again, this is, a, this, is a, this is an authority that has been very, very focused on this sector for quite some time. But over the short period of time that you have talked about <coughs> being in play, you have been very instrumental in a lot of things, especially yes. when it comes to the regulations and the regulatory pieces of it. Just explain something briefly in regard to the regulatory part of things when we look at policy, laws, regulations, and all of that. Okay, as I told you, we have basically three, three institutions in government taking forward the sector. Mm -hmm. We have our mother ministry, which is the Minister of Energy. It's responsible for setting pol policy and putting in place the right laws. We have the Petroleum Authority, which is responsible for regulation. And that means the laws are in place. We are executing the mandate of making sure the laws and regulations are implemented to the latter. Mm -hmm. And we have the National Oil Company, which is the commercial arm. Most people tend to confuse Petroleum Authority, UNOC, uh, mm -hmm. and say, you, are you in UNOC? But I would explain it in a simple way, like people are used to the communication uh, industry. Right. And you have the UCC in place, and you have UTL in place, which is a government uh, mm -hmm. entity. So mm -hmm. we are like the UCC of the petroleum, and uh, UNOC is like the, the, the UTL. But in doing that, we make sure uh, we are looking out for the key principles that I've talked about in regulating. One, we regulate to make sure that the environment, because the oil is in a place that is environmentally sensitive, is made sure that it's, it's handled in a way that the, the, the oil and gas sector does not affect it. Okay. Two, we make sure that the costs, because as seen here, all the costs are incurred now. At the time of production, they will recover all the costs they have in invested. Absolutely. So we make sure the costs are also within the normal, not uh, above what is expected. We look out for economics. Are the projects actually viable for mm -hmm. Uganda to take them on? We look out for national content, and that's why we're here. So we have specific laws, we have specific tools, we have specific regulations that are helping us regulate the sector. And over time, mm. we have seen regulation, and maybe I'll talk about it there. We have seen progression in everything from national content. We've seen development of companies, <coughs> increase in, pers in uptake of, uh, of contracts from about 28% to the last quarter of 36. So that is what we do in regulation. We use the tools, we use the laws to make sure we regulate the industry. Thank you very much, James. That was quite interesting. Very, very focused on uh, what you do. Now we move on to the opportunities. And I know for many Ugandans out there, the big question is, when, is, when, is, uh, I mean, when, when are things happening? Where is the opportunity? Matthew, I have been with you for quite some time in the oil and gas sector. I think from the you know, early 2000s, or, uh, sorry, uh, 2011, I think. Matthew has been with Sinuk 
for quite some time as well. Matthew, opportunities in this sector. People would like to know, where are the opportunities? Thank you so much, uh, moderator, Mr. Tony. Uh, our dear viewers, we thank you for joining us, finding time to join us for this uh, supplier development uh, e-conference. As uh, our host, uh, our moderator, Tony, has uh, uh, well told you, our theme for this uh, e-conference is preparedness of local businesses for the development phase of the oil and gas sector in Uganda. We, choose, we chose the theme to ensure that it is relevant and uh, our, our aim was to ensure that uh, small, uh, Ugandan businesses are re-energized and, and given uh, information that is relevant for them to partake in the uh, forthcoming uh, in the opportunities in the project that is coming. Uh, allow me, gentlemen, to uh, take you through some of the opportunities in the Kingfisher oil field, which where, where Sinok is the operator. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Lake Albert oil and gas uh, development project has currently two uh, ongoing uh, projects, which uh, is the Kingfisher uh, and also the Tilenga. The Tilenga is uh, Tilenga. Uh, project is uh, uh, operated by our partners, uh, joint venture partners, Total E&P, and, and Talo, while the Kingfisher uh, block is uh, operated by Sinoc Uganda Limited. Now, allow me to take you through the opportunities that uh, Sinoc Uganda Limited, uh, that is the Kingfisher uh, project has. What we've done as Kingfisher, we have unbundled, we have uh, several EPC packages, EPC by EPC, I mean engineering, procurement, and construction. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to unbundle. We have actually unbundled these into four. Uh, that is EPC one, two, three, and four. EPC one is the uh, drilling, pre-drilling civil works. These uh, works that are done before uh, the oil rig is put in place and before the actual drilling starts. So this package has been uh, uh, designed in such a way that, because it is majorly civil works, that it is going to be done by a Ugandan company, and this is in line with the national content regulations, which uh, actually uh, uh, mandate it to, on to, to only all civil works to be done by Ugandan companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is, uh, and here in this, there will be opportunities for a supply of uh, um, equipment, supply of goods like cement, steel, gravel, bitumen, uh, const and construction uh, supervision services. And all these uh, are here and available in Uganda. The second package, EPC2, is the Kingfisher oil field infrastructure. This uh, includes the detailed engineering design procure and procurement of all materials and equipment and the construction of a supply base, permanent camp, and safety check station. This is also going to be majorly uh, civil works that we hope a Ugandan company will partake. In the event that we are unable to get a Ugandan company uh, in, and, and an international company does it, we shall ensure that at least 70% of these works are done by Ugandans, especially the civil works. So. The third and most critical is the EPC3, which is the Kingfisher Oil Field Treatment Facilities. This will include the detailed engineering design and procurement of materials and equipment, the construction of a central processing facility, inflow lines, uh, lake water intake pump station, temporary camp, and the opportunities here, and if I give you a little details, the central processing uh, facility that we are going to construct is going to be a 40,000 barrels of oil per day uh, capacity with uh, four well pads and 31 wells. Some of these wells will be uh, water injection wells and others will be producer wells. And we shall ensure that at least in this package, much as uh, it is going most likely to be taken by an international company, because of the level of expertise it needs and experience in oil and gas, we shall ensure that 
the components of civil works and other components of camp, camp constructions that are in this package will be subcontracted to Ugandan companies. Then the, th the, the fourth and last uh, package, Mr. Tony, is the EPC4. And this is the Kingfisher uh, feeder line, which is uh, a 46 kilometer uh, feeder line or pipeline, oil pi pipeline to transport the crude from our Kingfisher field to the refinery in Kabale and the export hub. Uh, the oil pipeline, it joins the ECOP, the uh, mm -hmm. East African Crude Oil Pipeline. This, we shall have opportunities where our welders that we are currently training together with our partners and, uh, and uh, Minister of Education to make sure that these here, the, the trained certified welders of Uganda will have opportunities to work. We shall also subcontract all the civil works to the Ugandan companies. Then, uh, there are also other opportunities and packages in the drilling packages. Drilling packages, these are the companies, the, the packages that will actually have uh, the real core where the drilling itself will happen. These are going to be most likely either Ugandan or international but very experienced drilling companies. But we have mandated them or required them to train and employ Ugandans in the jobs that they can, uh, the Ugandans can do, and also to subcontract Ugandan companies in, the, in those fields like civil works and others where Ugandan uh, companies have expertise mm -hmm. and capacity to do so. The other uh, packages or opportunities will include construction of 50 houses. Uh, these are for the PAPs, the project affected persons, majorly along the pipeline and also in the areas of Kingfisher or Buhuka where we operate from, we shall have construction of a buffer yard, camp upgrade, uh, air, airstrip maintenance, helipad construction, and the list is long. This is just to tell you some of the opportunities the Kingfisher project is presenting to the Ugandans, and we want to ensure that Ugandans partake of this as required by the national content regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. That is quite comprehensive, especially from the Sinuk part of things, because when we look at this whole story, we also see that, you know, Talo is exiting. Total is taking over Talo, air, uh, Talo area. And there are also now more opportunities that are coming into shape. James, can you just explain some of these other opportunities before we go into the general discussion? Um, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, to add on to the opportunities of, uh, of, 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 of Sinuk, there are other opportunities. There is a saying that has been going around, uh, saying that Uganda turns a kunyumira. <laughs> I think uh, the oil and gas <laughs> has started kunyumira. Okay. Because I like that. at the place we are at, where we are seated, we have opportunities almost at four, lit four stages. Mm. The minister last year announced a new licensing round. So we have companies that are coming in to find more oil. So at licenses and with expression of interest, Companies will come in to add on to that. We had companies that were producing opportunities at those where they, is, they had issued, they issued lines, licenses but were not yet, had not yet discovered. So we had Oranto and Ama here, which got licenses, I think, in 2018. And they had opportunities there, and they are going to continue with opportunities because the project they have had, uh, they have acquired seismic data. Uh, now they are going to come and do some drilling of some wells to try and discover and add on to the resources. Okay. So those are two. But the most important ones are part of the CINOC project, the where we have had confirmed discoveries. You've heard that we have Tilenga up north, which is being operated by Total. We have Kingfisher, which is CINOC. Those present opportunities because we have had a process of pre-FID activities or pre-FI investment decision activities. We have had... Uh, feed being done, front-end engineering and design being done. We have the environmental studies being done. We've done uh, acquisition of land. All these have been done in preparation for the most important stage, construction. Mm -hmm. Construction of the facilities that will help ex remove the oil, construction of well pads that will help in drilling. These provide opportunities. That investment of Kingfisher and Sino uh, and Total Tilenga is expected to, to bring a cost of about eight billion. But when you have removed the oil, where do you take it? You either have to refine it or take it through a pipeline for the commercial market, commercialization. 
So we are building a 1,443 long heated kilometer pipeline mm. from Hoima to Tanga. Those are opportunities from civil to construction to, to engineering to electrical to telecommunication of the pipeline. Those are opportunities. Right. Then you also have a refinery that is going to come, a 60,000 barrel refinery. Right now they have done environmental studies, they have done geotech surveys. That one will also create opportunities. So I've t I'm telling you that oil and gas because opportunities will be there for Uganda. I guess that's yeah. an interesting one, especially from the Petroleum Authority telling us, you know, begin Akunyuma. <laughs> it's going to be fun. So let us just uh, go to Miss Benita Bagere. You know, Miss Benita Bagere is a very interesting lady. She's the founder and managing director of Albertine Oil and Gas Services in Uganda. It also has a subsidiary in Kenya. Miss Benita Bagere, welcome to this uh, very interesting e conference. I'll first of all ask you one very important question that a lot of local businesses struggle with. You have managed to grow your business, you have managed to go international, but this has also been very much around the partnerships you have forged along the way. Tell us something about the partnerships and how do you make them? Because we all know it's a capital intensive sector, a sector that not everyone can easily get into, but by forming the right partnerships, it becomes possible for your businesses. How have you done it as a business lady for your company? Uh, thank you, Tony. Good afternoon, and uh, good afternoon to my fellow pan panelists and uh, viewers. Um, Tony, it's all about preparedness. It's, first of all, it's about ha having an interest in the industry. That's the first thing. Then being prepared, doing research um, online with the Petroleum Authority, with the Chamber, with the international oil companies, and that's what I did and found as much information as I could possibly uh, about Uganda and about the current industry. I then started attending conferences, uh, international conferences, because that's where you're going to find the uh, international companies. I started attending them in Uganda, in Kenya, and other places, and talking to them and really getting as much and putting your house in place. Uh, making sure that your finances are in place, making sure that your social security is in place, taxation, uh, are you, do you have a website? Uh, because international companies are also looking for companies that are up to par with them. And through this, I have then managed to meet um, several companies and I've partnered with uh, like Emerson, which is a uh, an international Forbes 500 company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, because companies like that are also looking to partner with local companies. So where will they meet them? It's in conferences, it's at workshops, it's, it's, on, on, it's online. And that's what I, my, my suggestion to a lot of companies in, um, in Uganda or in East Africa is to, uh, first of all, start um, research, make sure that you're knowledgeable. So when you're, they're engaging you, um, you know what you're talking about. Basically, that's what I've done. But it's been a bit difficult, especially now with the COVID, because I've lost some, because mm. they have lost also um, their businesses, because you, obviously, you know, the oil, uh, oil prices uh, crashed. And of course, with COVID. So it's also difficult right now. It's difficult, but we just have to hang in there as much as we can. It's very interesting that you talk about, you know, trying to stay afloat, especially in these times of... Uh, COVID, you know, for many businesses around the globe, many companies have had to shut down, have had to shut down their operations. And I guess a lot of your operations have, uh, as well have been impacted. The fact that you do not have flights happening, I believe you're, you're right now in Nairobi, stuck in Nairobi for, you know, uh, whatever reasons. But in terms of supporting you beyond this, or even before the, uh, 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 the COVID pandemic uh, started, is there any dialogue from the government that you see that can support you or your industry in these constraints that we see a lot of Ugandan businesses uh, 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 are going through. And again, it will also be a, probably a leading question to James, because James, I think I need you to articulate the areas that are ring-fenced for Ugandan businesses so we can have a proper appreciation of these subsectors and sectors that are ring-fenced for Ugandan businesses. But back to you, Benita, could you just answer that? You know, I mean, um, are there enough, is there enough dialogue between the, 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 the local industry with the government in terms of trying to identify the genuine constraints? Tony, I think the government has done a great job in informing the public on what is happening, like informing about the opportunity, some of the opportunities uh, with, uh, they've done a great job in, in skilling and supporting um, 
those kind of industries and technical industries. But in terms of dialogue, I think government can do more, can sit with, um, with industry and discuss and really find out what is really on the ground instead of just talking to us. Yes, I think we need to go to the next stage um, uh, of dialogue. And this is where we are. They've done a fantastic job, but it's time for dialogue, especially now, again, after, during, after COVID. Some of the companies that were interested are not going to be there. They've probably shut down. Um, so what is the way forward? They need to really understand our thinking and what our issues are. For example, you know, some of the people I talk to, probably taxation, for example. If a company has, has been in um, operation for a long time and they have tax, tax issues, they cannot then qualify in the national uh, um, supplier database. What do they do? Is there a way they can start paying it off in installments? Those kind of things, because they're big companies that are gonna lose out simply because of issues like that, a lot of issues that they have. And I know, um, Tony, with Stan Big Bank, you've tried to help a lot on that, uh, but there's a lot more that needs to be done to really understand the, the, the issue and then see how we can deal with it. Thank you so much, Benita. Actually, just to emphasize for the viewers, to get onto the National Supplier Database, you have to be URSB registered. You have to have your uh, compliance uh, uh, approved by URA but also your compliance approved by National Social Security Fund, which is NSSF, and finally, it is the bank, right? So again, yeah. you will explain more about that and why it's important for you to be registered in a national supplier database for you to participate in the oil and gas sector. But now let me just move swiftly to Dr. Emma Naluyima, a lady who is known as Mama Pig for many of the people who have watched her YouTube TED Talks and so on and so forth. Welcome to this e-conference. And doctor, the first question I'll probably ask you is, what is the situation like for you in regard to the oil and gas situation or the oil and gas sector and the agribusiness sector? How are we prepared? Are we prepared at all? Thank you, Tony. Um, thank you. Now, I would like to thank James. When, when James was talking I, and he was saying, oil so kunyo mira. The same thing would be for, for, small, for agribusiness. And I would actually clap our hands, if, if it were possible. Viewers out there, clap your hands for Sinoc, uh, JP Wang, and the, the Agribusiness Incubator, because they've done a good job <laughs> by preparing us. Mm -hmm. But now the situation, what hurts is uh, the place where we really think, we would call it the oil city, Hoima. It's sad. We are not prepared at all. We are not prepared at all. I went to Hoima, I think a month ago. Yes. And then we go to this one. We, we woke up early because we needed to be there early and we're going to have a return journey. And we go to this hotel. It's supposed to be a very nice hotel. <sighs> they didn't have breakfast at 10. <laughs> <laughs> For us, the locals, yes. there was no breakfast at 10. Maybe we went in late, but I know there was no breakfast at 10. And we're like, okay, let's go and work. And then we come back at one. And no, we come back at midday. Lunch was not ready. Mm. You get it? And this is the local, and this is us, mm -hmm. as in. So what will happen when this whole thing starts? So we are not prepared at all. But then the good news is, like I said, club for Sinoc and the, the other the sponsors they're here to help us and you've been doing it for the last uh, i think every quarter you come out and tell people and everyone i just pray and hope this advert went to especially the people in hoima because it will be so absurd if this thing begins and the people in hoima are not doing anything and mm -hmm. then we are getting uh food from food from everywhere from from kenya or from it will be good if it comes from Kampala because it's still in Uganda, but yeah. it will be so sad that if we are going to start importing, okay? Yeah. And this is the chance. If, if there's a time agriculture is going to be so interesting and nice, it's going to be now when the oil and se gas sector starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just look at what he has been, uh, uh, he kept saying, Albert, and you know all this thing, and he kept telling us, you, you gave us all these opportunities in the oil, 
but I was just counting money for the, uh, from the farmers. I was just counting money because I was seeing all these people have to feed. You people, if the farmers are not there, you would all die. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that is money for the farmers. And this is going to be a very good time for us if we are to prepare. But anyway, we are here. I think I, I sent this poster to one of my friends and told her. Then she's like, I've not understood this. I tell oil and gas. I tell agribusiness. I tell you a vet. And then you, where do you come in? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait, this is where I come in. I'm going to teach them how to farm. And then we feed them. And then we feed the whole world. So we, we've partnered with Hokadeo, that is uh, Hoima Caritas, Caritas Development Organization. Yeah. And we've partnered with them. They have a piece of land lying out there. Yeah. And we're just going to, and I'm sure many people are wondering, but Emma, this smallholder farmer, and that's the gist. Because mm -hmm. everyone, 80% of Ugandans are smallholder farmers. So we're not going to wait for all these other people who are big. And then if we wait for the big people, what mm -hmm. will happen to the small ones? They will just trample on us. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the opportunities for the small older farmers to come up, we are going to train you. We are going to teach you. I've I've, I've, we, we are going to train you and teach you how to use your small spaces and produce a lot of money. So we are going to create a food hub. And all the food you are going to uh, prepare or grow, we are going to create a food hub ready for supplying to these camps, and then even ready for export. Remember, there's an airport right. going on. So this is the right time. And everyone there in Hoima, please, just start. I think it's a great opportunity. And maybe just to put perspective to this, mm. when you're looking at the oil and gas sector at peak, and I think James and Matthew, you'll back me up on this, you're looking at at least 14 to 15,000 directly employed workers. Eating quality food, not just the normal food from Mama Mary, but mm. the food that is at a quality hotel. What that means is that we need to have all of this food available 24-7 because the guys work in shifts, right? Now, if they work in shifts, do we have the capacity as a country today? I do not think so. So if you're looking at the 15,000 directly employed workers and you look at the 35 indirectly employed workers and the other 100 who are going to come about as induced uh, 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 coming in with all this, you know. I mean, that is like about 150,000 people who need to eat quality food. So I think it's very important when you talk about agriculture. But Dr. Emma, just before I leave you, let me just go back to the question of what do we have to do as a country to prepare ourselves for this story? Now, as a country, of course, we have to educate or equip farmers with knowledge, which we are going to do, mm -hmm. or which we have been doing. So we have to keep them with knowledge, like you've said. This knowledge for them to know that they have to produce good food quality food that has to be eaten by these workers so that they're healthy okay and that's where there's a challenge in uganda we don't respect so many things like uh the drug withdrawal period if you use uh, chemicals mm -hmm. but it's going to be paramount for the farmers to do it well so that we produce good food otherwise these people are going to import food because we are dealing with uh, i think expatriates we're dealing with so many people who mind their health and if we have and you know we have all this land, we have all this weather, so we have to make sure that we do it the best way. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have to equip, the, equip farmers or with finances. That's where the bank comes in. Okay? Because if you want us to work, we don't have that money. So, like, we, we, we are going to follow uh, Beatrice's advice to be bankable. We have to do certain things. Okay? But then we need finances. We need access to finance to make sure that we can have uh, these farmers really do something nice. And then we have to have g quality inputs. Mm -hmm. Again, now government has to come in, the UNBS, they have to make sure that everything that is supplied or the things that are in the country, the inputs that are in the country are of good quality. Because that's again another big challenge when it comes to the farming world, okay? And then technology, good technology, I think access to technology in all ways. Uh, when we talk of technology, we think of the very big tractors and all that, but there are different simple, simple, uh, um, technologies but that are going to help irrigation solar irrigation uh you know these things mm -hmm. that we really need to make sure that work and they are going to equip and help uh, farmers to deliver absolutely you're talking about climate sm uh, climate yeah. uh, smart farming which is becoming the norm right now and that's quite interesting but also we also need to sort of think about how making it affordable and i think that's also what you intend to do in hoima and again we applaud you for that now i'll come back to james james you know the sectors that are ring fence for Ugandan businesses, 
because again, it's very important for us to talk about these sectors, but also for Ugandan businesses to prepare because as the oil and gas sector is, it's a very time-bound sector. And because it's time-bound, the companies like Senok will not wait for Mr. Otoa to get ready. They will move with whoever is ready, whether he's coming in from Malaysia or whatever. What are you doing to support the businesses, the local businesses, as Petroleum Authority, in trying to support these businesses to become ready? But first mention these business, uh, th sorry, these sectors, and then tell us what you're doing. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, it's a very interesting discussion because there's a lot that has been put in. Sure. Just as I told you that uh, apart from putting the necessary institutional and, and legal framework, there's a lot of initiatives that have gone. But let me first deal with the institutional and legal framework. There are specific national content regulations that help promote national content and a bit favor Ugandan companies mm -hmm. in these. In those, reg in those regulations for the oil and gas sector, there are specific ring-fenced goods. That these are ring-fenced for Ugandan companies and Ugandan entities. Those include ICT and equipment, environmental and waste management. Uh, they include food and, uh, and uh, they include catering. They include HR services. They include uh, civil works. They include, there are 16 services there on the regulation. So anyone out there needs to interest themselves in these regulations to know the 16 ring-fenced services. Now, apart from the law that facilitates, as PAU, I think it's the only sector, the oil and gas sector, where you find national content is embedded in the institutional framework, that you have staff and people dedicated to ensure mm -hmm. that Ugandans participate. That's why CINOC has a national content person. That's why I'm in Petroleum Authority. Outside other sectors, I don't think that has been done. But on those, we government has had very many other initiatives. I'll run through them. For example, we've started agriculture development program mm -hmm. that is implemented, targeting the four districts that are in the Albertine, Kikube, Hoima, uh, Noya, and Bulisa. This is to help feed and develop the agriculture of that area. Mm -hmm. So that when the oil starts, when you go into EPC, the 14,000 direct workers you're talking about, the 105,000 induced that will be in the region, almost a million people in the Alberta and Graben, there is no shortage of food. So that program is running mm -hmm. and identifying farmers to make sure they produce on top of the national supply. Number two, there are specific capacity building initiatives that have been implemented by government. In areas of HSC, because HSC is very important for the sector. So in areas of HSC, in areas of bidding, in areas of bid management, those are important and government through development partners with the help of development partners has been doing those programs basically to, s to equip Ugandan companies. Mm -hmm. The other is that there has been the a national supplier database. This has done magic for us, that we're able to have a database of people and know their capacity and know their gaps and where we can develop them. You'll be surprised that we've had stories from people who are coming to do the EPC, seated in London, seated in uh, wherever they are, having access to the supplier database and identifying someone who has a stone query in Hoima and telling him, you know what, we want to enter a joint venture with you because of his visibility to the industry. So that's another tool. And we have some companies there from Ugandans. The, this has grown from about 500 in 2017 when we start to over 1,700 today. And 70% of those are Ugandan companies. Now, the other initiatives that are in place are that regional conferences. Mm -hmm. We have preached this, and I remember this when, you've, uh, when you were still in total, Tony, from about 2014-15, we started having conferences, seminars, mm -hmm. telling people about these opportunities. This is not the first. We've been to Hoima having the national content conference. We've supported the... IOCs in having quarterly conferences, two in other places, two mm -hmm. in the region. We are preaching about these opportunities every day. I think it's about time we all wake up and we say, fine, these opportunities, we're hearing them, how do we prepare? Government is coming okay. in to support. And lastly, maybe for funding, we've seen it's a very big challenge. Yes, the yes, National yes. Content Policy realizes there is a gap mm -hmm. in relation to funding and has proposed a National Content Fund. The government is developing instruments so that we can be able to help where there is a problem with capital to be able to help the companies be able to deliver. So I could sit here, Tony Holder, and talk about the initiatives, 
but government is doing a lot, especially through PAU, to make sure that we put farmers and all our other sectors into able to participate in the sector. We are focusing on sectoral linkages mm -hmm. to avoid what you hear, the oil cast. You don't have to concentrate on oil alone. Mm -hmm. Concentrate on other sectors. How do they fit in? How does agriculture fit into oil and gas? How does tourism fit oil and gas? And we've dropped, we have had sectoral linkages, specific interactions with different sectors. How does education fit in oil and gas? To make sure that the sectors are also alive to these op opportunities. Uh, thank you so much, James. That's quite interesting. And I guess for many of our viewers, you can join us by, you know, asking some questions off Slido. We are on www.slido.com. And when you get to www.slido.com, look out for the code 47977. You can post your questions there and we'll be answering them or my amazing panel here will be answering. Um, let me just go to get on to some of the questions off Slido and coming to you, Matthew, I will ask, how may Sinuk and Stanbic Bank help SMEs to make sustainable or sustainability uh, a key as part of SMEs or SME business strategy? And then also tied to that, and I will add, because it's very crucial for us to also acknowledge uh, the social implications of such projects. You know, we, it's one thing to just think about the opportunities in terms of money, but it's also another thing to think about the social implications, which are inevitable. And Nicholas is asking, how can we incorporate awareness on gender-based violence, GBV, particularly targeting SMEs in the oil and gas sector as part of the SDGs? GBV affects their personnel. So, Matthew, can you just answer those? Yes, thank you so much, Tony. Um, <coughs> and that's a very, very good question about sustainability and continuity. As CINOC, uh, to ensure sustainability, we have uh, gotten into strategic partnerships with uh, uh, organizations like the Stambic Bank Incubator to ensure that Ugandan companies uh, and SMEs are trained. Uh, we are also engaging uh, other uh, other stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Minister of Education to ensure that uh, we, we train Ugandans to be able to partake in these uh, 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 upcoming uh, opportunities, especially uh, certification of, uh, for example, welders. Uh, we also ensuring that uh, every year we shall, as CINOC, be training about 70 heavy goods vehicle drivers okay. to ensure that there is a, a availability of uh, uh, trained and certified personnel to transport uh, the equipment from uh, uh, Mombasa to Uganda. Mm -hmm. We are also looking at environmental issues. We had uh, to ensure sustainability, of course, uh, the environment is very key. Uh, we have uh, done an uh, environmental impact assessment for the entire uh, uh, Kingfisher project uh, and uh, recommendations have been made and uh, uh, eco-sensitive uh, uh, areas have been mapped to ensure that the oil and gas uh, uh, industry or our activities do not have a negative impact mm -hmm. on the climate, on the environment. and. Uh, Several other initiatives like tree planting with NEMA. We have a project with NEMA where we plant quite a number, some thousands mm -hmm. of trees per year. We are, we are actually engaged in also uh, trainings. We have engaged uh, some local companies in Hoima mm -hmm. where we train uh, uh, our, uh, uh, the, pr the, pe the people that host us, the people around the Kingfisher area on financial sustainability and uh, how uh, to, for example, uh, manage uh, uh, traffic. For example, expecting uh, a lot of traffic, mm -hmm. uh, of trucks and all that. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at safety issues where we train people on how to uh, cross the roads, how to be careful, uh, and stuff like that. Very important. And, and, and this issue of sustainability and continuity, uh, we are taking it seriously as Sino. Absolutely amazing, Ben. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just now go back to Benita. Benita, yeah. is the public confident that we are, as, I, mean, as, I mean, as we get to FID, everyone has been saying FID is very close. FID, by the way, for many of the viewers, is final investment decision. Benita, as we get close to this FID situation, uh, are you confident as a business? Do you think a lot of 
the public or the public is confident about engaging in this oil and sector once again. Let's also realize or recognize that many businesses burnt their fingers in the last period because of lack of information and jumped into a sector they never clearly understood. But we've had enough time to prepare. Are you ready? Are your peers ready? What's your story? I'm sorry, I don't believe that the public is confident that FID um, is going to be announced in uh, 2020 or and some or 2021 because of like you said they were burnt before and uh, the dates keep changing so do they invest or reinvest in their business waiting and uh, waiting for FID or what I believe will happen is a lot of companies are going to wait and watch and then join later once they're confident. But at the moment, I think it's going to be very few of us. And like Dr. Emma is saying, if a hotel in Hoima cannot even prepare breakfast, what about other companies or other sectors? Um, that's, that's very tricky. How is government now going to convince us that FID is finally coming? Because every year FID is coming, FID is coming, and we're still waiting. I am confident if after... Um, Total's announcement in April, uh, but are other companies uh, confident? I don't know. I think we need to hear from James. <laughs> I think we're going to have to hear more from James, and James will, of course, tell us more before we close this. But let me just go back to Dr. Eman Alima. Um, we are talking about agriculture, a sector that very many young people are not very uh, um, enthusiastic about because of the returns. How do you convince the young farmers, and I'm, I'm excited whenever I go on to Twitter and I see how many young farmers are out there, you know, doing so much amazing stuff in the area of farming. How do you plan to change that narrative and make it an exciting venture for us to understand that when we talk about oil and gas, as a smallholder farmer, as a young person, there's money in that venture and I need to start preparing myself. How do we go about that? Okay, now, before even, this is, the, what the question you're asking is for now. <laughs> But then we need to, yes, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to answer it. But then I, thanks to God, gave me a vision. <laughs> <laughs> we all do get visions. <laughs> and this vision started four years ago right. when I started training the young. So when, I was open, when we opened my school called MST Junior School, it's a primary school that is tailored actually to teaching the young how to farm. It's normal school. But our, our you have a bias. We have a bias to agriculture, right. and this it's amazing what these young learners do. Yesterday, the other day, we had a, we had another stream li live stream uh, conference, e conference, and then it's the learners who are telling us what they were, they were doing in uh, in COVID around COVID, and they were t telling uh, training there. So, as when when. Uh, he talked about different companies joining with education, so that's very good. We, sh we need to start it from right do down right, there. Right, but now, right, going right, forward, right. we have to include the youth in the value chain, youth and women. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, yeah, the youth that have, have not been uh, given a chance to maybe to go to schools like MST just need money at this time, and they, what do I do? But then they don't really need to get involved in agriculture, maybe. They want, you know the youth want smart agriculture. <laughs> they don't want maybe get dirty, but there's so many things they can do. Right. Uh, the, the ICT now there are youth that are dealing with uh, um, apps maybe to help farmers do things like uh, tell the temperature. I mean, tell the weather. There's an app, an app that helps farmers f uh, mix their feed. So there's so much going on. But if you can include them in the value chain. That would be good. And then we give them all these opportunities. They, we, we tell them that, no, there's this. You don't really have to go I in the dirt. But then you can pick the food from here. You can package it. You can do what? You know, all that. Mm -hmm. All that. Okay? So these youth have to be given, again, the right information. And then we have to give, uh, of course, there are those, like you've said, you've seen youth that actually are doing it. We have to put those youth that are doing it at the forefront. In the limelight. And then we, we show them so that these other youth get to see that, oh my, if so and so did it, I can do it because I'm that, and she's, he or she is my same age. And then we, we take it from there. And then now the other people uh, who are already uh, farming, mm. like maybe the smallholder farmers who are already doing it, who are already there, this is what they need to do. They need to go into associations. They need to go into um, 
what is it called? Associations, circles, circles uh, cooperatives, okay? Like you said, uh, in Uganda there's a saying, Om Kisampeo, Musanga Yete Gese. So, we have to make sure we get ready so that this, when this FID comes, whenever it comes, we just take it on. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting. You know, I, I was reading actually something that was talking about uh, being prepared versus luck. You know, everyone thinks, oh, if they see someone driving around and they're saying, that guy is lucky. But no, he probably he was prepared. And when the opportunity came, he jumped onto it. And I think that's what we are yeah, trying to another thing, what, another thing I forgot, actually, I would give advice to, again, the youth and the women who are already doing it. Please, uh, there's this competition right now, uh, the Best Farmer Competition. Mm -hmm. why, am I, why am I saying it, that it's going to help you? Because it's like we, there's, um, you mark and do this, uh, their, their guidelines, okay? Right. So if, if you want to be like a Best Farmer, even if you don't want to, but you enter there, when you go in there, you'll be subjected to certain things. And when you're subjected to them, they will help you improve yourself, even if you don't win. But then you will have gotten a step higher to organize yourself. Okay, so we only have about uh, a, a few minutes left to the end of this very interesting discussion. This discussion, in my opinion, in my world, can go on for years or days, but I think we have to get ourselves short. So I'm just going to ask you just in one minute to give me your final remarks, but also your great ideas of where you see us going in terms of getting prepared for the oil and gas sector. And I will begin with James. James, how do we and how shall we get ourselves prepared? One minute from you. Uh, thank you very much. Though you posed the question to me. Absolutely. Uh, you can answer uh, that first. That Benita sent um, yes. about the company's readiness. I think this thing of FID, uh, as companies, we need to now look at being ready. Because mm -hmm. if, if FID is taken now, are we ready? Should be the question. Yeah, we're not. Has it been a blessing that there's been maybe a delay in FID for you to get ready? Mm -hmm. FID in the oil and gas industry, I need to make two points. The oil and gas industry is not something that is predictable. Right now, there is a delay in FID because of maybe negotiation and what. But some other ca countries are affecting are being affected because of the low prices. Mm -hmm. So the industry becomes still. So the players have to come and understand that the oil and gas industry is not the normal smooth. You'll have the ups and downs, that curve. And either FID has been taken, tomorrow it will be prices, another day it will be a spill. You have to be able to understand that the industry works like that. Number two, the process of FID comes along with different things. There are different things that feed into FID. These have been ongoing, like uh, e environmental studies, feed, everything. So for me, the question is that our company is getting ready, taking advantages okay. of this delay to deliver. That should be the question for Benita, and, and that should be a question everyone. for everyone there Absolutely. who is interested in the industry. So as I close, yes. the oil and gas sector uh, and national content for us has been key. It's <laughs> been growth. We've seen companies move from providing food only to being able to do seismic data acquisition, mm -hmm. to do geotechnical surveys. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's a process we're committed to. We encourage the companies, we encourage the players there to get interested in it. We're here to provide information, and I'm sure we can do economic transformation through participation of Ugandans in the sector. Fantastic. Thank you. Your one minute, Matthew. Thank you so much, Tony. What I can tell the Ugandan suppliers is that uh, I'll give them th three or four pieces of advice very fast. One, ensure that your goods and services conform to the national or the oil and gas standards, to the bare minimum at least. That is UNBS, all ISO standards. Then ensure that you meet project needs when you actually get a contract. Ensure that you meet the quality needed, ensure that you meet the quantity needed, and ensure that you meet the project schedule so that you can be able actually to get a next contract as well. Then uh, thirdly, ensure capacity, uh, development of capacity by forming joint ventures, strategic ones, like we are doing with uh, uh, the incubator. Then and ensure that you train during this period, train and certify your staff, and also register uh, on the national supplier database, if you are not yet, and also for the Ugandan uh, employees, uh, register on the National uh, Oil and Gas Talent Register for visibility so that you someone out there can notice you and possibly form a joint venture with your company. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Tony. you very much, Matthew. So, Benita, your last parting shots. 
Um, Tony, thank you very much. What I can tell Ugandans is really to be prepared. A lot of information is out there. Go online, go to Petroleum Authority, go to the chamber, go to whatever the ministry, whatever is available, and try and get as much information and ask so that you can be prepared. We are closer to FID, um, I believe, I honestly do. Um, and I think that um, whatever information is needed, most of it is online. To, mm -hmm. And that's a very uh, good place to start. Um, also, I think uh, what I would tell them is because, you know, when we, we're talking, we always think of the civil works and all the technical things. Ugandans need to be aware that even lawyers, um, you know, can be or, or caterers or suppliers of eggs. Every sector can benefit in the oil and gas industry. Um, I also would like um, our neighboring countries, we keep talking about the East African community. So I need to let them know also that they can participate. East Africans are welcome to come and participate in Uganda. Again, all the information is online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benita. Thank you so much to the amazing panel. I would like to thank each and every one of you who joined us for this first ever e-conference. Coming out to you from Serena at the NTV studio. We would like to thank the producers for putting this out there for the general public to know, but also to make you realize that we are here to support you. We are here to make it easier for you to understand the oil and gas sector. Petroleum Authority is always available and can be contacted through their website. At Sinuk, Matthew is at hand as well to support you. And of course, at, Stanbe at the Stanbeck Business Incubator, we are available to make your businesses robust, to make your businesses withstand what it takes to be formidable in the oil and gas sector. That is who we are, that is what we do, and we can guarantee you that it will happen. So we thank you so much, and ladies and gentlemen, have a good afternoon. <laughs>